The following is a production of Notch 6 Media. It's the Notch 6 online podcast, episode number 65. In this episode, Alex Mallier joins me to tell us about his ever-changing O-Gage layout and taking ordinary O-Gage locomotives and making them something extraordinary. It's all ahead on this episode of Notch 6. This is the Notch 6 online podcast. Notch 6 is the podcast dedicated to O-Gage trains. Whether you're collecting, operating, or just getting started, Notch 6 is your home for O-Gage news, events, and interviews. Now here is your host, Derek Thomas. Well, welcome to another episode of Notch 6, brought to you each and every episode by your friends at trains.com. That's T-R-A-I-N-Z.com. At trains.com, there is an awesome selection of O-Gage trains. Some O-Gage trains between 50 and 60% off of retail price. Some amazing deals, weekly auctions on O-Gage trains. It's all happening at trains.com. That's T-R-A-I-N-Z.com. Thanks to trains.com for powering Notch 6 every episode. We really appreciate it. Well, welcome in again to Notch 6. If this is your first time listening, so happy to have you on board. I'm Derek Thomas, and uh, this is the podcast, online radio show, whatever you want to call it, that is all about the O-Gage hobby, about O-Gage toy trains, and everything that makes this hobby great. Today is no exception. Just ahead on this episode, Alex Mallier will join me, talk about his uh, layout, talk about tearing it down, starting over again, his uh, what we'll lovingly refer to as kit bashing of, of modern Lionel locomotives. I guess it would be uh, hot rodding would be a better word. That's a, a fun topic that comes up during this interview. And also we'll talk about uh, some of his modeling projects, which have garnered him some attention from uh, some bigger names. But we'll get all into that later in the episode. Something I want to lead off uh, with this episode, and I'm going to take no more than two minutes to do this. I'm looking at the clock now going, okay, Derek, you need to cover this in two minutes. One of the changes that you might notice this month in, at the show is that we are adding more sponsors to the show. Uh, three sponsors on board the show now. Trains, which of course you're already very familiar with. Also on board starting this month, Angela Trotta Thomas, who has a new book coming out uh, at the end of October, which you'll hear about later in the episode. And TW Trainworks, Roger, who you are familiar with from uh, the LCCA shows and, and some other episodes in the past, are all sponsoring the show now. And I just want to take a moment and, and explain why sponsorship is so important to this show. This show is completely free, and I made a promise to myself that it would remain completely free when we started the show. So basically, for the last two and a half years, everything that the show has cost has come out of pocket. Not that that's a huge deal. I love doing this. It's it's not a huge deal. But one of the things that I've always wanted to do is take the show, make it bigger, make it better. And sponsors are what's going to make that happen. And all three of these folks are, are pitching in and getting behind the dream of making Notch 6 something that's truly innovative in the O-Gage industry. And that is something that I just want to uh, encourage you guys Reach out to these sponsors. Tell them that you appreciate them keeping this show free. Just like you guys are out there and supporting the sponsors over at the OGR Forum, the for, the uh, advertisers, Classic Toy Trains, the advertisers, No Gauge Rarity Magazines. We need that sponsorship money too to c- continue to run the servers, to upgrade the equipment, and it's also going to provide some more innovation here over the the coming months. And so uh, again. Our thanks, and and we're asking for your support of Trains.com, TWTrainWorks.com, and AngelaTrotaThomas.com. Make sure you say thanks to all of those folks. That's it. That's my sponsorship pitch here for the next few months. Nobody likes to talk about it, but it is just a a reality of what makes this show go. And like I said, uh, just super appreciative of those folks of getting behind the dream of what this podcast is and what we want it to become. Okay, that's the end, I promise. It's on to the world of O-Gage Trains we go, and uh, there's a lot happening or a lot that is getting ready to happen. Obviously, end of August here. Um, We've got news about the Lionel Volume 2 Catalog Show. Listen to the end of the show. We'll talk about the Lionel Volume 2 Catalog Show at the end of the show. We'll give you the details on that and when that will be coming to Notch6.com. That's coming up. Uh, York is... (laughs) coming rather rapidly. Um, 
always, you know, York is kind of the, the official kickoff of train season, if you'll call it that. And so that is uh, just around the corner, uh, less than, I think, eight weeks until uh, the York meet in York, Pennsylvania. And uh, yeah, things are just getting into the swing and, and it's exciting. You know, as much as I love summer and being out and about, train season is really, really, really fun. And, you know, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. I'm also a Christmas nut as well. And so, you know, with with everything that happens with, with Notch 6 and the Madison Poster Company, my mind is all, already working on, on stuff for Christmas. And it, it's just, it's like, all right, Christmas is coming. So uh, the excitement is building there for me as well. But yeah, train season is back. Uh, Notre Dame football starts up here pretty quick, which is another big passion in our household. Uh, we are big Fighting Irish fans. And I know some folks may have just turned off the podcast after hearing that, but, uh, you know, I think we can all live together in peace and O-Gage harmony, despite our college football differences. So, uh, yeah, college football season kicking off. And like I said, train season just around the corner. No matter how you slice it, a lot to be excited and a lot to be thankful about as we head into the fall here. And uh, so without any further ado, we're going to head for our feature interview Again, Alex Mallier will join me. He has a great story about his layout, which was just featured in O-Gage Railroading Magazine earlier in this year, and he's working on some exciting projects that he's going to tell us about as well. Alex Mallier, just ahead right after the break on Notch 6. This episode of Notch 6 is brought to you by Angela Trotta-Thomas and her new book. That's right, I said book. Angela has been creating amazing paintings of Lionel trains for the last 25 years now, And now, all of her great paintings are all in one location. The name of the book? Painting an American Icon, the Lionel Train Art of Angela Trotta Thomas. You can find out more information about the book at AngelaTrottaThomas.com and pre-order the book just in time for the holidays. Our thanks to Angela for supporting Notch 6. Mark your calendar for October 3rd and make tracks for TW Trainworks' fourth annual layout festival in Dallas, Texas. You'll experience the art of the train up close and personal with over a dozen operating O-Gage layouts. You'll get a behind the scenes look at how the TW Trainworks train engineers have created some of the most spectacular layouts in the United States. Most importantly, part of the proceeds from every admission to the TW Trainworks Layout Festival goes to benefit the Ronald McDonald House of Dallas, Texas. For more information or to RSVP to this event, visit trainworksfestival.com. Works is spelled W-O-R-X, that's trainworksfestival.com, or call 877-881-4997. This is Not Six, your first source for breaking news and in-depth interviews in the world of O-Gage. Welcome back to Notch 6. You know, one of the things that I love about doing this show is not only do we get to interview a lot of great people within the O-Gage industry, but once in a while, I want to get back down to the roots of this hobby, to the hobbyist that is out there building great layouts, doing some really neat and innovative things. And there are a lot of people that I want to introduce our listeners to in this hobby. Alex Mallier is one of those folks. He's somebody who you should know. He's our guest this month on Notch 6. Alex, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you here. Ah, thank you very much, Derek. It's uh, good to be here. And, and I am so happy you're here. You are from the wonderful land from the East Coast known as Staten Island. And you know what? I need to get more New York people on the show because in all honesty, I just have fun talking to you guys. You guys uh, have a spicy personality and it makes for a great interview. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I, I start every interview asking everybody the same question, and, and you're no different in this case. And tell me a little bit about growing up and how you were introduced into the O-Gage hobby. Well, it's a pretty common story. My father introduced me to trains, of course, when I was a kid. He started me off with the basic uh, Lionel set that his father purchased for him when he was a kid, and he uh, set it up for me. And we ended up with the, the typical four by eight table with, uh, you know, a couple of switches on it and some Lionel, you know, accessories and so forth. And that's how I really got started. Got it. And so growing up, were trains something that were constant in your household or were the trains something that just kind of came out at Christmas and then went back away? Were the trains up year round in your family? Yes, it was. When I was a kid and uh, all the way up to, I would have to say, the teenage years, 
Uh, there was trains around. There was, there was some sort of a layout, uh, some sort of a setup, somehow, some way, something, always, until about the teenage years in, in, in the house I grew up in with my parents. And then I'm going to take a guess and say from that point forward, the, the story takes the typical turn of cars, girls, school, and everything else under the sun. Is that right? Uh, yes, definitely. Yes. The, <laughs> the train sort of took a, a back seat, and that's what came to the front, the cars and the girls and, uh, and school. Got it. And, you know, part of the the other part of the story that we'll uh, clue our listeners in on here a little bit later, but the cars and the girl also become a very, very important part of this story because the cars play a significant role uh, in some of your modeling techniques, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the girl who ended up becoming the wife uh, also is a big supporting part of your hobby now, correct? Oh, absolutely. I, that, everything you just said is just is just absolutely correct. <laughs> well, there's, like I said, there's there's some good stories here. And, oh, yeah. and Alex and I have talked before we recorded this, but uh, we've got some great stories to get into. I want to ask you, okay, so so the cars, the girls, the school comes along. How did you get back into the hobby? Where was your reentry point and what happened? Okay, the reentry point was when I, actually when I married my wife. We bought our first home. Uh, this is our second home we're in now. Our first home. We ended up, of course, you you you, you fix the home, you 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 do all your upgrades, and once that's done, you, you go, you know, you run down the basement and you finish the basement, and uh, you know, we ended up having an around the uh, room wall layout. It was like up above, and uh, that's how the trains when the trains were reintroduced, which was around 1990. Okay. So then the cool thing for you has got to be you've kind of watched the hobby come into this modern technical age. I mean, you and I both then kind of remember the early rail sounds innovations. And what are your thoughts on, you know, how far we've come really in the last 25 years? Because I know on your current layout, you're involved with all the command control and things like that. Uh, it's got to be pretty amazing to have watched this whole thing evolve. Uh, yes, I have to say, oh, I enjoyed every step of it. Uh, and I'm really, I, I love, I love the command control. Cannot believe what you can do with it. The play value is just amazing. I just couldn't ask for anything but I love it. Are you running? Pretty sure you're running uh, TMCC slash Legacy for sure. Are you running DCS as well? Have you gotten them to play together on your layout? Absolutely. I have. Yes, I have TMCC, uh, Legacy, and DCS. Uh, I wouldn't want to shortchange myself. Uh, in any way, I feel having um, all the control systems is the it's the best. You get the best of all the world. Something I'll ask you, and and since you've gotten all three command systems to to work on your setup, and we'll talk a little bit more about your current setup here in a few minutes. Was getting all three of the systems, well, or or two of the systems, theoretically, since TMCC slash Legacy is one system now, but was getting the two systems to work together as much of a challenge as I think uh, some people think it is? Um, I have to say, this is my second layout. I know we're going to get into that, but my first layout in my new home and, and my second home, I should say, and my, and my second layout, I, I have, haven't had any problem at all. Uh, they, they, they made it together with no problem. I had no issues. Uh, it's just, it was, it was smooth. So, so no, no special tricks or anything like that. It was pretty much when you designed the layout, you knew you were going to be able to put them together and pretty much take off. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I, I don't know if I, you want to call it uh, <laughs> beginner's luck, <laughs> but I, 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 I had no trouble. I, any main line that I had, I, I think they call it a star pad and wiring. I didn't the drops, the power drops. I didn't put too many, and I didn't put too little. I uh, just try to keep it in the middle, and I had no trouble. Let's. I, I'm curious because you know everybody kind of has their own opinion on how many power drops. Do you have a rule of thumb when you're building your layout for for how often you are are making power drops on on your main lines? Uh, okay, for any given main line, also depending on the size of it, I try to do the you know I try to put five uh, power drops per main line. You know, that's just my opinion. That's it. It's just the way I like to do it. And I find that I don't have any uh, signal issues and any, you know, any power issues. 
that's good to hear. And like I said, there's everybody kind of has their own school of thought. You know, I think my rule of thumb is once every six feet. But um, I think the big thing, the big point that we want to get across is it's not just one run back to the transformer and that's the end of it. Anytime you put a layout together such as the size of yours, you're going to need multiple power drops along the way. Right. I would call them, as we used to say in the uh, electrical business, I would call them home runs. We, okay. We, we call them a home run. That's what it's called. Like you go, you're going from one portion of the track right to your uh, terminal block to your transformer, and then you're moving to another area of the track down further and putting another one in and going to your terminal block and your transformer. That's good advice for anybody out there who is in the process of wiring or building a layout. Keep that in mind that power drops are essential to having good electrical continuity around the layout. And I'm I'm making up my own words, but I think the listeners get the point. Let's talk about your layout. It was featured in the February and March issue of O-Gage Railroading this year, but that version of the layout was not your first or your last. Tell me a little bit about the previous layout and the layout you have planned that, that is in construction right now. Okay, the, the, the previous layout, um, it was a little larger than the one I have now. Um, it was when you first put up a layout, you get excited and you say, you want to pack your entire basement with as much trains and track and buildings as possible. And, uh, you know, that's what I did. It was kind of, it was very tight down the basement, but I still loved the layout. Um, it had five main lines. It was a lot of grades up and down, all the main lines connected to each other, which, uh, you know, made a lot of uh, uh, maintenance. It did make a lot of maintenance, you know, because you had a lot of, you know, of uh, issues and repairs and stuff. Still was a lot of fun. Um, I had huge, huge mountains, and um, I had this, this, this idea of putting, making trains disappear into mountains and then come and reappear in a different area. And I think a lot of people who have come to my home, uh, you know, witnessed that with the old layout. But uh, this time around, I changed that up a bit. Okay. So we have trains entering and exiting the stage, as a lot of people like to refer to it. And uh, I think that's one of the, the tips that I like that you're highlighting here, because a lot of us, you know, get bored with the, you can see the trains at all times. And, and in your case, you made a very conscious effort to make the trains disappear for a while and then reappear somewhere else. Um, so, it sounds like it worked well. Yes, but I, it did work well. But I think I, it was a little overkill because I think I made the trains disappear for too long. I only had... I don't know in a percentage, like um, I only had, let's say, one main line out of 100%, you might have been able to see maybe 30 and 40% of the track. And, you know, that got to the point after a while, like I said, I'm covering too much train. I'm hiding the trains too much. Yeah, it's a good point. I, I, the mountains, were, they were huge. And um, there, was, there was, I think there was 21 tunnel portals. I wow. I think it was a total of 21 tunnel portals, if I'm correct. And uh, it was very nice, but again, I think I hid the trains too much. And I packed that first layout into um, my basement where there was just one walkway uh, to get into the layout and to get back out. Okay, so that clearly presented some challenges, especially, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when you have guests over, it's one thing if you're operating by yourself, but if there's more than than a couple of people in the room, my guess is uh, everybody got really friendly really quick. Yes, it was very tight, the best way to say it. Somebody walked down the aisle. Uh, They were pretty much stuck at the end of the aisle unless someone got out of the way, you know, to get back out. And I felt that, you know, even for me and anybody else who looked at the layout, it was kind of, you know, uncomfortable. That was part of the reason why that layout came down, that we did end up having some um, uh, water issues in our basement. We had a raised subfloor. I'm, I'm an ex-contractor, and I knew for a long time I was smelling, I guess you would call it mildew, in the basement, and I knew there was water underneath our subfloor. So I didn't know how bad it was because the layout was up for, I think, about at least eight to ten years. Uh, but when we ripped up the subfloor, we, we, got, we were very surprised what we found. 
<laughs> you know, that's I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges. And some of the guys down south and, and out west don't understand this because they don't have basements. They have bonus rooms <laughs> that yeah. are that are up above the house. But getting getting a space for your layout that is watertight and isn't going to create issues is probably one of the biggest challenges that no one ever really thinks about until it's too late. Yes, I, I um, at the time when we first built that, my first layout here in this new home, I was working a full-time job, and, you know, we finished the basement as fast as possible, and, you know, I didn't think everything through, and uh, we missed a couple of uh, areas where water was able to get in, and it did get in, it did creep underneath the, um, the subfloor, and I had a tremendous amount of mold and mildew underneath the subfloor. So I knew that layout had to come down. Okay, so that was that sounds like kind of the linchpin in, in terms of you know obviously there were there were some areas that you wanted to redo of the layout, but sounds like uh, fixing that issue was kind of the linchpin that made the decision of okay, it's time to start over again. Yes, it, it was it was yeah it was a couple of things that I said this is time. Uh, it's been eight to ten years, and it's time to start over. So um, we ended up uh, completely dismantling the old layout, which was kind of sad. I took pictures along the way, and I did post them on the forum and everything. And, you know, we took everything down, and I completely started fresh from, you know, wall to wall and floor to ceiling. As you started fresh again, um, what are some of the things that you like to do differently? Obviously, we, we've talked about, you know, making the trains appear on stage more often. What are some things that as you head into this layout and, and from what I've seen, the bench work is, is complete and it looks like main lines are coming together. What things do you want to change this time that are going to make this version of the layout better? Well, there's a few things. The one, one big thing, which a lot, which I, I, don't, I don't know, if, you know, I'm speaking for myself, my control panel, my original control panel and, and um, was, was underneath the layout. Okay. So anytime there was a problem, you had to go underneath the layout to uh, diagnose, troubleshoot, or whatever, uh, a certain problem with a wire or whatever it may be. Uh, this time around, I put my control panel, my complete control panel, at eye level uh, showing in the basement. So I can literally just walk up to this control panel, and everything is labeled and marked, and if something goes wrong, I don't even have to bend down. I'm standing straight up. And if I want to add something, it's very simple just to run a wire and add it. It, it, it. It's absolutely no problem. That was a big factor. The other factor was I wanted sweeping curves on this new layout. I wanted these large, large sweeping curves because I think a train looks absolutely beautiful on a sweeping curve. I agree. Let's talk a little bit about the control panel for a second because you've touched on something that's got me excited and something I'm sitting here going – Gosh, I wish I would have done that. Yes. So getting the control panel at eye level, what a great idea. What all do you incorporate uh, into your control panel? So we're talking um, if you're using power bricks are at eye level, terminal blocks are at eye level. What else do you have on your control panel that makes it a functional tool for diagnosing problems? Okay, well, it's a, a mixed control panel, which, which when, when I say mixed, it has MTH and Lionel electronics on it. And we, like you said, we have terminal blocks. We have, I also have uh, rocker switches, on-off switches for all the yards, uh, the diesel uh, sheds, the yards, the, um, uh, the roundhouse, spur tracks. Uh, I also have the uh, DCSTIU, the AIUs, legacy control, all right in front of me. And I also have all Ross switches with the switch buttons right on the panel. So this way I can control my switches through DCS, but I also could control them by just pressing the button. And the button is right at, again, we're at, everything is at chest and eye level. So it's quite easy. Everything is marked, everything is labeled. Um, and like I said, for my first layout, it was almost impossible to find an issue, a problem, or even add a wire. You had to crawl underneath the layout you know, to diagnose a problem or to add a wire or to, or to add an accessory or to, you know, it was just too much. So that's why this time around, we decided to put the control panel at our chest and eye level, which has just been absolutely fantastic. 
I love it. And something else I want to highlight to our listeners is with those rocker switches and being able to turn yards and sightings and things on and off, the bigger your layout gets, and, and this is really talking to, to, to the folks that are just getting started or planning a layout, the bigger the layout gets, sometimes it's harder to trace problems down. With rocker switches, like Alex is talking about, you can turn off and isolate spots on the area. So it's easier to isolate trouble spots with rocker switches blocking things out like how Alex has done. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's the way to do it. You, 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 and all my rocker switches are on, any, like my yards, my, um, uh, the, like I said, spur track siding, that's all on one side of the uh, MTA Z4000 um, transformer. So this way, that's dedicated to just one side of the transformer. And then I have two Z4000s in total, and the other three handles control the, the outer main, the inner main, and eventually the upper main. Okay. Tell me, uh, size-wise, about how big is the new layout going to be? Um, the layout is, in size, we're talking across the back, we're talking 22 feet, and it, um, it's a double dog bone, I guess, U-shaped double dog bone. And coming from, let's say if you're on the left side of the layout, uh, coming from the back wall up, you've got 15 feet. And if you're on the right side of the layout, uh, coming from the back wall, you're about 16 and a half feet. Okay. And so you're able to power that entire layout off of two Z4000. So I just want to give folks kind of a, a, an idea of, okay, this is what size layout I can power off of those kind of transformers. Oh, yes. They will, they will handle it quite easy, uh, easily. And so will the uh, Lino uh, ZWLs or even the regular Lino, you know, ZWs, they'll, they'll handle it. There's a, there's a lot of great options out there on the market right now for power, isn't there? Absolutely. It's good for all of us. All, you know, and, and I've said it before on the show, you know, we are, we are living in another golden age of, of the amount of technology and innovation that's happened in our hobby in the last 15, 20 years. It's just incredible. I, I feel the same way, and I think we're pretty lucky. Um, I, I agree. I agree with you. To have all this at our fingertips and and be able to, um, you know, pretty much uh, drive a train. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting awful close, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about some of the scenery and elements that you're going to incorporate into the new layout. Um, looking through photos of the old layout, I can see that that there was a carnival scene. Um, what are some of the important scenes that you want to incorporate into the new layout? Okay, the new layout, I want a different way. Um, I want more industrial scenes. Uh, we're talking um, roundhouse, turntable, a nice uh, oil field. Um, I'm going to have I'm gonna have a nice harbor scene with a, with a truss bridge. We're, we are going to have a mountain. It, it's not going to be like my old layout. Uh, there will be, you know, one mountain on the layout trying to think what else we will have there will be a small town there will be it will be more industrial uh with like coaling towers sanding towers uh more of that than what i had on my last layout which was a lot of just like regular towns like you know stores and 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 private homes and you know, i wanted to go a different route this time yeah, I think one of the challenges uh, with anybody who's building a layout is finding that mix between having things for the trains to do and necessarily an industrial setting, and and especially when space is is a at a premium on these layouts. You know, uh, there are some great operating accessories out there. Uh, you know, the MTH Firehouse Gas Station Mel's Diner come to mind, but those things eat up space on a layout so fast, and it makes it hard for them to interact with the trains as well. And and I've heard a lot of people going the same route as you as more industry gives the trains more to do. Yeah, you get you get what I call, I mean, not only I call, it's called play value. You know, the play value with, with more industrial, you know, you're getting sidings, you know, spur tracks, yards, you know, you, you can move trains in and out, you you know, like you could have a, um, a general light and power building where you can move the coal cars into it, pull them out, you know, there's just so much you could do. And it makes it... Uh, a little bit more interesting. Absolutely. 
Switching gears a little bit, you've become really, really adept at improving the sound quality and smoke units on, on the O-gauge trains on your layout. What decided to make you start cracking open locomotives and, and trying to make them better? Well, for quite a long time, I um, looked in on, on O-gauge railroading's uh, forum. I watched for quite a while. There's uh, plenty of experts on there. And I've seen them doing it, and I have a background in electrical. I used to do electrical work, and I was also you know, a carpenter, and I did all that. We were brought up into that. So um, pretty like mechanically inclined because, like we were saying with the, the hot rod cars before, um, I used to, you know, I'd pull an engine out of a car and rebuild it. So this the, the passion just, you know, stayed with me. And uh, learning from a lot of the greats on, on the OGR form, I um, – wanted to get into it myself. And, uh, you know, I didn't look back. I just said, the only way I'm going to learn is if I, uh, if I just do it, you know, if I just do it, but I made sure I, I did it on, you know, my own, you know, items. And, uh, you know, this way, if I did make a mistake, <laughs> it's on me, you know, and I could, uh, you know, take care of it and repair it and fix it. I think, uh, you, you've hit on a good point that, that, before you started doing this, you you had a a mechanical aptitude, I guess is what I like to call it. But but a lot of us kind of come from that same background of you know uh, for me it was opening up and taking VCRs apart as a kid. For you it was you know building and tinkering on muscle cars. You know a lot of us have that that just um, that nature of wanting to figure it out and seems like that has kind of played a big role in, in you being brave enough to start cracking open some of these locomotives and, and taking risks to improve them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If I just don't give it a shot, you know, then I'm never going to know. And I'm a type of person. I love to know how something works. Like I said, I, I, I can't praise the, the uh, old age railroading form enough and the guys on it who, um, you know, they, they open, open up their eyes to all of this and, uh, you know, and you learn and you watch and, uh, you know, you, you take a back seat for a while and uh, then, then, then you do it yourself, you know, and you figure it out. And, I, and I'm uh, grateful for that, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of great knowledge there on the OGR online forum, and, and we're so happy to both of us uh, be a part of that community. And it really is a community, and and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but that community for you has become more than just people you correspond with online. These guys have become your friends, and, and that plays a really important role for you in terms of how you enjoy the hobby. Oh, yes. I, I, I have such a lot. The, the friends that we've made, my wife and I, uh, just it's just wonderful. Um, there's so many great people. It, it, it just gets better and better every year. Something that that I've noticed as we talk about kind of some of the tips and tricks that you figured out to to make things better, uh, especially inside these locomotives. And I'm just I'm I'm recalling a couple of projects you've worked on in terms of improving some sound quality and some tenders and smoke units. You're not necessarily reinventing the wheel. Something that that you have done a great job at is going through the Lionel parts catalog and taking parts that weren't necessarily designed for a specific locomotive and retrofitting those into an older locomotive. Uh, so you're not necessarily doing all of this from from square one, but you've figured out how to make parts work well in a hybrid situation. Yes, I have, and um, I, I, that, that comes from also, um, you know, with the muscle cars and the, the being mechanically inclined. Uh, you get that, that, that curiosity and, and that feeling. And, uh, you know, I like if I had an engine that had, um, you know, a so-so speaker in it, I says, uh, why not try uh, a fat boy? As long as the ohms match and, you you know, you do that correctly and you follow, you know, that protocol, you, you're fine, you know. And you end up with um, a nice uh, heavy base in, in, in an older uh, line LT MCC engine. The other thing that I, I can recall that you've done that I think is a really smart idea, and, and like I said, we, we haven't reinvented the wheel necessarily by doing this, but Lionel has started uh, enclosing a lot of their speakers in this clear acrylic shell that kind of fits the inside body of the tender. Can you explain to me how those clear uh, acrylic shells kind of work in encasing the speaker and redirecting the sound? Well, um, there's, there's um, Lionel, that's pretty ingenious what they've done. They have this, it's, it's a lower flat bottom base, which is separate from the top cover, I should say. And um, you, you would attach this base, this bottom base, 
to the the chassis of the tender, and you would put your your either if it was one speak. Sometimes you would have one large fat boy speaker, or sometimes there were two um, baby fat boys, and you would put this enclosure on the top and screw it down, and you would have such a a, a strong, um, heavy. Uh, I guess I would call it a thrust, you know, base coming out of your tender. It's just fantastic. Yeah, these shells are pretty cool because what they basically do is create an echo chamber, and yes. instead of letting letting the sound escape into the shell of the tender, these these shells force the sound down and out the bottom of the tender, out the speaker holes, while still creating that kind of uh, reverberating bass inside of the tender. And it's really cool to see to see how Alex has done this on some of his steam engines. It makes a huge difference. Yes, I have a New York Central Dreyfus, a TMTC New York Central Dreyfus that I've done it to. And um, it had just, a, you know, two plain... Uh, cone speakers in it, and I wound up uh, putting these. I put two fat boys in it with the speaker enclosure, and you, you, I mean, it, the, the bass is just it's just amazing. From what I can recall, that Dreyfus got a lot of upgrades. That Dreyfus kind of became uh, super super Dreyfus because you threw a lot of neat add-on parts and things into that, and uh, it be it, it took a locomotive from ordinary to pretty extraordinary, if I recall correctly. Yes, yeah, that that had the speaker upgrade. It was originally designed with two chuffs per evolution. Um, I upgraded it to four chuffs per evolution, uh, which is uh, prototypical. And um, it also had a puffer smoke unit, mechanical puffer smoke unit, but I pulled out the puffer smoke unit and I uh, retrofitted a, uh, a Lino fan-driven smoke unit in it. And uh, now she, uh, you know, she has uh, all the bells and whistles. Yeah, and that's something that's pretty cool, and that's why I love talking, you know, with guys like you, Alex, is that you've taken these engines that, you know, so many of, <laughs> and this is this is the world in general. We're so good at getting excited about the latest and greatest thing that's coming out, and we're like, oh my gosh, it has this, and it has whistle steam, and it has that, and you have done a great job of going back and taking some of these locomotives that may have, uh, I don't know if I want to say they've been forgotten about, but they're just kind of considered, you know older technology and you've made them cool again yeah you know and and it's nice that that all that's available to do doing too because you know they're kind of nice uh, locomotives also what i added to that engine what i failed to mention before was it's called a super chuffer from hennings they designed um what's well, actually john and hennings designed um the super chuffer and it's just fantastic because you're getting you know you're getting four chuffs and and four puff, puffs per evolution you know out of out of an old uh, TMCC engine, and, and the smoke output is just amazing. That engine will smoke you out of a room. Oh yes, it will. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and I want to be clear here for a second with our listeners. Uh, Alex and I aren't necessarily advocating that you go crack open your new engine and oh, and <laughs> start no. going to town <laughs> trying to figure it out. No, not at, at all. What so at what point did you kind of decide, okay, this engine, you know, it's out of warranty, you know, at what point did you decide an engine was worth kind of putting under the knife, so to speak, and starting to make upgrades to? Well, like I said, this Trifus Hudson is, I, I don't remember the year it came out, but it's probably like 2004, 2005, maybe, I'm not sure. And, you know, when you upgrade it, you, you, I'm saying to myself, you know, this engine's 10 years old, you know, at the time. What am I waiting for? Why not? You know? Why not uh, make her, you know, as close to a, a legacy engine as possible? Right. And so, like I said, we're being very clear. Do not go rip open your legacy no. engines and start playing around with the soldering iron. Otherwise, no. I'm going to have Mike Reagan chasing me around with an axe at York, killing me because of all the returns they're getting. Right. He would chase me around, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think either one of us want to get in trouble. No, I don't want to be chased around by him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to be chased by Mike Reagan. And, and no. for those of you who, who don't know Mike or have never have never met Mike in person, Mike is uh, slightly intimidating uh, <laughs> physically <laughs> and attitude. And, and I, I tell you what, Alex, you might stand a better chance just because, you know, you're from the East Coast, rough and tumble. Us guys here in the Midwest, we're soft and we just run. 
I, I don't know. I think I'd run too because Mike is six six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, again, the point being, don't go rip open your new legacy locomotive. If you've got something older, yes, I encourage you. You know, if you're feeling brave, you've got a mechanical background, and take it from Alex. There are a lot of cool parts available in Lionel's online part catalog, which you can find at Lionel.com. Dig through that catalog a little bit. And there are plenty of little goodies that you can find to to dress up some of these older engines. Also, before you do crack open an engine, always ask on the you know old gauge railroading you know form. Uh, there's plenty of guys there that are always willing to help, including me. If you if you want to take a shot at this and do it, you know why not? You know, and there's plenty of people. There's hundreds and hundreds that know how to do it. You know. Yep, and and you make a good point that. If you're trying something, usually you're not the first person who's been down that road before, especially with some of these more popular locomotives over, let's say, the last 15 years. Um, I can think of, you know, the the Century Club 2 Niagara being a big one, something that that has kind of uh, been plagued with some aging problems. And and like I said, the guys that have, have gone down that road and fixed the problems, you're not necessarily the first person to go down that road. So being involved with the community and asking questions can make that job a lot easier because there's a chance that somebody else before you has done it and has learned a lot along the way. Oh, yes, I agree with that. That's how I learned. You know, always, always ask before you do. Yep. All right, we're going to switch gears again here. And <laughs> so when I asked you to do this interview, you you were a little hesitant, to be honest. And when you explained why, I was like, okay, you've got to tell me more about this. You initially hesitated to come on the show because you're in the middle of, uh, dare I say, a little project. Tell me about your little project. Oh, okay, well, besides uh, building plenty, plenty, plenty of uh, structures for Corva models, on a daily basis, um, I was also asked from OGR railroading by uh, Rich Melvin to uh, build approximately 125 uh, OGR Ameritown structures. Uh, they're, they're, I think it's called their eight series. And the project is underway, and um, Rich will be mentioning it on the forum and on the website. He'll be mentioning it shortly. I, I don't know. I would say maybe within a month, I guess, um, they will be announcing it. And I'm in the process of doing it right now. We have about 40 to 50 structures um, up and built uh, as we're speaking today. Uh, there's still probably about 50 or 60 more to go. Wow. That's uh, that's quite a haul for anybody. You know, some of us have trouble trouble finishing one structure in nine months, let alone 120 of them in in what's going to end up being about an 11 week period. Kind of t- walk me through that process of how you're managing to build that many structures and kind of keep it all straight. Well, what I do is um, I'll take a certain uh, type. Uh, like one model number, and I will stay with that model number. If I'm going to build 10 or 12 of that one style building, I won't change off. I'm going to take all 10 buildings, and I'm going to do all the fronts first, and then I'm going to do the sides, and then I'm going to do the back. But I have, I guess, a little bit of a crutch, I should say, a help, or um, I don't know what you want to call it, um, I used to paint muscle cars years ago, and I, I'm an excellent taper. I know how to tape off uh, cars. So instead of sitting with a paintbrush trying to paint each window on the Maritown structure, I'm able to tape off the building front or side or back, whatever it may be, in a matter of, I don't know, it's going to be quite fast. I could probably do it in about six or seven minutes. And that's all I have to do is take a good quality uh, spray and I spray them in my paint booth and I rip the tape off and I have uh, six, nine or 12 windows, you know, whatever kind of style building it is, uh, painted in a matter of 10 minutes. So wow. It, it makes it, it makes it a lot faster. That's uh, awesome. Let's talk about it for a second. I want to know what kind of tape you're using because, you know, are you using regular masking tape? Are you using like 3M fine line tape that's used for automotive? What are you using to make it, this work? It's it's 3M. It's uh, just blue tape, blue painter's tape. That's all you need. 
Um, if you, once you tape a building down, uh, a face of a building, all you got to do is push on the tape a little bit and um, you won't, will not have uh, any problem uh, with it leaking onto the, uh, you know, the bricks or, or anything like that. But again, like I said, it makes it much, much faster. Certain parts of the building have to be hand painted. So what I did was my sprays match my uh, brush paint. Um, I took the spray cans to my local hardware store and I had them uh, matched and I um, got brush paints to match exact. So nothing would be off in any kind of color or shade. There you go. That's smart. Yes. That's really smart. Yes. So I have every spray color that I have. I also have a, a, a brush paint. And uh, the only difference between, I, I, don't, I think the spray, I don't know what the sprays are made out of, but I know they have to be uh, removed with like a thinner, but the brush paints are latex. So if you do make a little mistake, it's pretty simple just to wipe the latex paint right off. Very cool. That's that's some good advice. I'm curious because I always run into this, <laughs> I always run into this problem is I get in a hurry and when I do tape things off, I like to pull them off sooner rather than later. How long do you usually wait before removing your your tape jobs after you paint? Well, I think some people are going to say I'm crazy, but I I will spray a front whether it's uh, uh, an OGR, a Maritown structure, or a Corbett structure. I will tape it off in 10 minutes and I will spray it and the tape will be pulled off less than a minute later. Whoa, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> and I never had this. It, it, I think it's the best thing. I, for me, it works. I don't know if it's, it has to do with the temperature or the humidity in my shop. I don't know. But I, I rip my tape off in less than a minute um, and I do not have uh, any problems at all. That's awesome. You know, something I'm curious about, because I'm sure we've got listeners out there who, who are looking at you, and and let's be real honest for a second. You're making, uh, this is your livelihood at the moment in terms of, you're making a go out of this thing in terms of, uh, this isn't just for fun anymore. I mean, this is your business. Kind of, uh, you know, for, for our listeners out there who are thinking, you know, I would love to be uh, involved in the in the business side of this hobby. Can you kind of explain how, how your opportunities came about? Was it something that, that folks came looking for you? Or did you kind of have to put yourself out there and say, hey, look, this is what I can do. Are you interested? Well, I think the way <clears throat> that worked was I would I was building some structures, you know, like on my own, I would post them on the forum and, you know, I guess people would see them and, you know, kind of like them. And then I was approached um, by Rich Redmond from Corber, and he said to me, um, you know, I would like you uh, to do buildings for me. And I says, uh, I think it's great, you know, and um, I, I wanted uh, full involvement in it. I love it. I used to be a contra, you know, a construction worker, contractor, and now for me, it's I'm still building buildings, only just on a, a much smaller scale. Very neat, very neat. And like I said, it's it's cool to think that you know you're making a go doing this, you know, and and let's let's be really clear with with folks here for a second. Nobody's necessarily getting rich doing this, but it can be incredibly rewarding. It's that that's it's it's more of rewarding than anything else. Um, I absolutely I'm 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 happy I'm very happy. Um, I love being in my shop uh, hours upon hours a day, and uh, you, you you're getting a reward at the end. You're seeing the, the structure built. It's beautiful, you know. And you say, hey, look, I did that, you know, and it's wonderful. I think what's going to be kind of neat, and I, and I hope you take some pictures and post them uh, as you get closer to completion on this project. But and you and I were talking about this off air. When everything's said and done, you you've taken enough care in, in planning out how these buildings are going to be built that you should be able to line up all 120 of them, or you know, blocks of certain kits, and you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between between any of them in terms of they the paint's going to look the same, the weathering's going to look the same, the details are all going to be the same. And I think that's pretty cool that you can keep it that well organized. Yes, well, I should say each style building will look the same. Um, I think he gave me the six styles, uh, so which means when I say styles, the fronts are different, and the, of course the buildings have you know different names on them. But each style will look the same because, uh, like I said before, I will do uh, ten or twelve in a row of the same style 
and just the fronts. I will not change off to a side or to a back or to another side. I stay with the same. I will spray all 10 or 12 or whatever it is, and then I will put the brick mortar on all 10 or 12, and I will just keep the same pattern. Then I will wipe off the brick ma- uh, mortar on all 10 or 12. Then I will do the, the, the tape off and paint all the windows and, and other details and hand paint all 10 or 12 before I move on to anything else. So there's almost a rhythm to the process in terms of it's just, you know, <laughs> wax on, wax off, if I, if I can steal a line there. Yes, it, it, yes, absolutely. But as long as I just have to realize that every, uh, I would say every two hours or so, just to walk away from the bench for a few minutes, <laughs> just to, um, you know, to, to gather yourself again, because you're looking at the same thing for hours. And it, then it helps, you know, you just walk away, uh, you know, you take a, take a stroll, maybe walk over to the layout and then come back a few minutes later and then right back at it. Now, I don't want to steal O-Gage Railroading's thunder. Obviously, there's an announcement coming here pretty quick. Um, but but for those of us who don't have the patience and, and necessarily the skill set to to do what you're doing, uh, these buildings that you're building obviously are going to be for sale at some point. Um, will those be available through, through O-Gage Railroading, I assume? And I, I know you have buildings available through Corber as well. Is that correct? Yes. Corber has something called Corber Complete, where instead of somebody just buying a kit, and, and building it themselves, maybe, you know, maybe they don't have the time, you know, they work a lot. They could just, the building kit could be sent to me and I will build it and then send it to them. The same thing with OGR, uh, he's going to have them available on the website. And I'm sure that between, as your, as Corber too, and OGR will be, will all be for sale at York. Very cool. So if you're looking for some uh, completed structures at York to add to your layout, or uh, if you if you don't make the trip to York, sounds like um, these structures will be available for you to order online as well. So definitely uh, check with both of the companies, and that way you can pick up some of Alex's work to to have at home. Um, as we, as we start to kind of take this thing into the home stretch. You know, doing as many buildings as you're doing for for Corber and OGR, what's one trick to modeling that you wish more model railroaders knew about? Um, maybe not a trick, but just a tip. Um, I could call it a trick or a tip. I, I would say a big factor is weathering. Um, I had a, it took me a while to learn, and again, uh, looking at some of the greats on the forum who um, really do some great weathering, and the, the realism is just fantastic. Uh, don't over weather a building, you know, where it just has to look like, you know, like a, like dirt. It, a, I think just a light weathering just makes a building look more natural. And I, that's basically it. I mean, that's my tip, you know, just don't over weather, you know, a, a structure, you know, light weathering is nice. Not everything has to look like it's been through a war and a dust storm all in one shot. No, because like if you walk through a, you know, pretty, you know, town throughout the country, you know, unless it's a town that's been completely uh, decimated, you know, the buildings aren't dis- disgracefully dirty. You know, they're just, you know, they got a little, just a little weathering on them, you know, and I think that's uh, that's adequate for them. Something I want to wrap up on, and this is something um, that, that I think is really unique, and, and we've seen a lot of discussion about this on, on the OGR forum over, I would say, the last six weeks. Um, something that you do uh, a couple times a year with your friends from the forum is you have an open house. And, you know, I, I hear it talked about all the time that, that this hobby can be, um, it can be a really individual hobby. You know, layout is pretty much the ultimate expression of, of art for, for an individual. But you are one of those folks that, that you're willing to say, all right, I built this, now come look at my art. You know, what, 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 makes you want to open up your home to these folks and say, come see what I've done? Um, it, it's not only to see what I've done. It's also that they're such great people, um, and we love uh, the company. Um, and, and it's great to talk, you know, just trains for a day, trains and buildings and scenery. And um, it's just it's just so enjoyable. Like I, just our last open house, I think it was about two weeks ago. Uh, we had... It wasn't our best attendance, but we had, I think, about 40-something people. I think it was like 46 or 47. Uh, the one the year before, I think, were in the high 60s. So uh, it's just wonderful to have all these people in one place at the same time 
and just talking trains and enjoying some great food and stuff. And, uh, you know, just having a great, just a great day. It's all about trains. It's neat to see folks go out and, and take the people who they've met on an online forum, turn those people into friends and <laughs> invite those folks who they may have never met before in their life, except through an interaction on an online uh, chat board. And suddenly, you know, you're, you're breaking bread with them and showing them your layout. I, I think that's really neat. And, you know, for, for folks who are, who have concerns about, you know, safety, security, things like that, um, have you ever had any problems having folks in your home with your no, layout? Not, not at all. And the la- I think we've had four, we've had four annual open houses. Plus, uh, throughout the year, there's always people, um, you know, coming over, and uh, you know, it could be just a few people, it could be five, six people, it could be two people, but I've never had a single issue. Alex, I tell you what, it sounds like you're doing some amazing things in the hobby. We wish you nothing but continued success as you continue to build this new version of your layout. For the folks that want to uh, see pictures of your layout as you go, what's your handle on the O-Gage Railroading Forum that they can see photos under? Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just Alex M. That's it. You could just uh, you know click on that, and then, uh, and you could see all the, uh, the buildings and stuff I've built over the years. Alex Mallier, an O-Gage Railroader you need to know about, and now you do know Alex. Alex, thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it, and best of luck on finishing up the buildings before York. Oh, thank you so much, Derek, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks to Alex for his time and for a great interview. Hope you guys took away as much from the interview as I did. Before we wrap this episode up, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Lionel Volume 2 catalog show which is a staple for us twice a year now. We get together with Mike Reagan and Matt Ashbaugh from Lionel. We go through the new catalog. We talk about everything that's new, everything that's cool, and we go deeper than the surface of the catalog. You'll get inside details on things that you're not going to find in the catalog. And so that show is coming to Notch 6 at noon on September 4th. Mark that down on your calendar, September 4th at noon Eastern is when we will launch the catalog show at Notch6.com. And of course, Notch6 is always available through iTunes and Stitcher, however you prefer to get your Notch6. Again, through the website Notch6.com, Notch6 on Stitcher, iTunes, Facebook. We're all over the web. September 4th, Lionel Catalog Show, mark it down. And I already have a a feeling you guys are going to get a few exclusives that uh, you're not going to find anywhere else. That'll wrap it up for this episode of Notch 6. We'll be back in September, of course, with the Catalog Show and another episode of Notch 6 with somebody else in the world of O-Gage Railroading. Until then, keep it in Notch 6. Thanks for listening to Notch 6, the only podcast dedicated to O-Gage trains. You can find every episode on our website, Notch6.com, or on iTunes and Stitcher. We'll see you again soon. Until then, be sure to keep it in Notch 6. The following has been a production of Notch 6 Media and is intended for private use only. This show may not be copied or redistributed without express written consent. This show copyright 2015, all rights reserved.